Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see you here this morning. Uh, welcome to, to church this morning on this cool uh, August morning. Hopefully, hopefully this isn't a sign of the end of summer here yet, so let's, let's have another three months of it, right? Amen. Can I get an amen? Yes, yes. <clears throat> All right. A couple of announcements here quick, like, before we, uh, before we do get started. Uh, I, I was just talking briefly this morning uh, with Katrina, and she said Victor Weigel was moved into a, a different place in the hospital uh, just yesterday, was this? Right, just yesterday. He's having some heart condition or heart issues that they're not 100% certain what the heart, what's causing it and things like that, but the overall big picture is that he's, he's not uh, recovering like he should be. Things are not going like they should be going at this point, and so it's a... Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions and, and a lot of concern um, around that right now. So please keep uh, Victor and, and Bev, of course, in in your prayers here in the uh, this week and the coming weeks. I stopped over this week and saw Dottie uh, over in the war. I, she she was doing pretty well that day. It was good to good to see her. I as I was coming, I bumped into a couple other members of the church leaving, and so it's good to see that there's people um, able to get over and visit her as well. And if you ever have a chance, if you're over in Lamore, just stop in, uh, say hi to her. She, she, I'm sure she'd appreciate it and, uh, and love to see you. Um, I know that, uh, I, I know you had some surgery here. When, when did you have surgery, Raymond, this past, was it this week? We could go Wednesday. Okay, so um, your name, we didn't get your name in here, but we'll keep you in prayers for recovery as well. And, I mean, of course, also in just your your support and, and with uh, with Dottie as well. So, um, a couple other prayer requests you can kind of look through ones that we have had. Um, I was going to ask Tim. Is Tim here today? Tim Cal. No. Is, is there any updates on his on his dad? Um, his dad has one more week of treatments this coming week, and then the reassessment that the Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, uh, is there any other, there's not many announcements uh, in the attention line, so you can read through those um, if you can find time. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's not much there. If you want to add something though now, uh, announcements uh, or prayer requests, uh, be interested to hear what you, uh, what, what we've kind of missed. Is there anything that we need to add to this one? Any announcements at all? Do you know when Sunday school is starting? Uh, I don't know for sure. I know at our council meeting uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked briefly about starting it. Last year, it started the first week of October. This year, we're going to try and start it, I believe. Um, I'm not going to say we're going to try, but Amanda was going to check with parents and see if we could start earlier. So it would likely be maybe middle of September uh, after school. After school's got going and after Labor Day. So uh, we'll, be, we'll be in touch on that here in the next, I'm hoping in the next couple weeks, we'll have it nailed down. Down there before they start. Okay, okay. Thanks for the heads up. Uh, any other announcements this morning? Any prayer requests this morning that need to be added? Uh, if we have a fire this morning in the church, you don't need to worry. We have a firefighter sitting in the, in the back over here. That's you, Rosa. That's you. So, just to make everybody at ease today, no worries about that. All right, we'll get started. <clears throat> Please stand, and uh, we'll begin this morning on page 56. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most
most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, if you would, you can be seated, you can be seated for our opening hymn today. Faith of our Fathers, number 500 in the Greek hymnal. Uh, I'll just add one quick thing here before... Uh, we start singing. Uh, you can be thinking about the hymn of the day today, which we're going to be doing as another congregational favorite. So start thinking now, and when I ask, be uh, ready to jump right in with your favorite. So, but for now, faith of our fathers, page five. Is
but foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all of these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Here ends the readings. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Last week I, I had spent some time in Hebrews. I'm going to stay in Hebrews today. Uh, Hebrews is, I've probably said this before, one of my favorite uh, texts. Uh, this particular uh, text in Hebrews, I'm going to let it speak today kind of for itself as, as much as possible because it's a compelling text. If you heard it just being read here a moment ago and you, and you paid attention, it's really eye-raising in a sense uh, to, to, to see what's happening, what's actually going on. Uh, the title of the, the message today, though, is A Faith for All Seasons. A Faith for All Seasons. Now, for some of us, it may be that faith, our faith in, in Jesus Christ, our, our, our Christian faith, is strongest in the midst of good times. When we get the job we want, when, when the bank account is full, and the crops are looking good, 
when everything's going well, your health is, is doing well, your children got a full ride scholarship to college, and it's easy at that point to have a strong faith and say, thank you, God, for what you've provided. And sometimes that, that is what people uh, really helps energize their faith. Uh, for other people, and maybe for the same people, and maybe we both we have both of these experiences, faith is energized in the dark times, where the bank account is empty, the crops got hail, uh, the, uh, the job process didn't come through, you didn't get the job you want, your health is failing. And in these times, you turn to God. And your faith is energized in these times. And I think probably we experience some or the other of both of these. But it's also true, it would probably tend in one direction or another. And so it's no surprise that even in the Christian faith, and this is the sort of flip side of it, even in the Christian faith, it can kind of be turned in such a way as to say that when you really have faith, the good things happen. That's what brings the good things, right? And so one might think that when the good things aren't happening, we don't have enough faith. Or we're not obeying God in the right way, or we're not doing the right thing. And so we, we begin to blame ourselves because, obviously, we might hear words or something that put us in a position to believe that things, good, good things should happen when our faith is strong. And all of these messages... These messages get sent unknowingly, both by our own voices in our head and by our uh, things we might hear, songs, interpretations of scripture we might hear. And what happens is we begin, you dropped your fireman's hat. We need you to be wearing that. <laughs> what happens is we begin to allow the circumstances that accompany our faith, so listen carefully, we allow the circumstances that accompany our faith to determine the strength of our faith. Whether that be good or bad. And that's not how it should be. Ultimately, I want to read for you here this text again, or parts of it, from Hebrews as we jump in. First of all, the author is talking about, by faith, what people did. They crossed through a sea. Uh, the, the Egyptians attempted to do so, but then were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho came falling down. Okay, these are, these are good things. This is the conquering nature of faith. By faith, Rahab, who was a prostitute, by the way, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she received some spies that were sort of some spies um, in, in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me. Then This is great. Time would fail me to tell you Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who conquered kingdoms and through faith administered justice of pain promises, even shut the mouth of lions and quenched raging fires, escaped sword and won strength out of weakness became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. Alright? Now, certain theologies would love for it to end right there. Certain churches, certain pastors would love for that text to end right there. If you have faith, you're going to be conquering armies. You're going to be splitting seas. You're going to have your best life soon. Maybe even now. Some theologies would stop there, but the text doesn't stop there. What happens next? Women then received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release. Others mocked flogging and even chains. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. Those that I just read about had the same faith as those that I read about moments ago. Right? That's what's shocking. That's what's compelling about the text. 
That's what we have to love about the text as it actually is. Because it takes the whole world into account. It takes reality into account. We all know that life isn't perfect. We all know that life isn't going to always be your best life now. We all know that sometimes bad things are going to happen. Even sometimes you're going to get sawn in two. Let's hope that never happens. But that's what happens in the text. This faith we have in Jesus Christ is not a fake faith. It's not a, it's not a faith for a world we want to construct. It's not a faith for a world that doesn't exist. It's a faith for the world that does exist. And that's why I love it. That's why I think it's true. If it was one or the other, it probably wouldn't be true, because we know that's not what life is like, right? A faith for all seasons. I want I want us to consider here what that kind of faith might look like. Just for a few minutes, I'm going to just give you a few things about if you're going to have a faith for all seasons, wherever life is at, three things I think need to be true. To have a faith as is evidenced in the book of Hebrews here today. Number one, it must be rooted in the reality of our world. And I already was just hinting at this a moment ago. Uh, there's a, te- uh, a quote by C.S. Lewis, and this is, uh, I don't know when he wrote it for sure, but which book. He wrote this, he said, There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second, is claimed by God, and counterclaimed by Satan. Every square inch, every split second, is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. The reality of a world that we live in is a reality of conflict. It's a reality of warfare. There is something going on deeper than all of us even understand or could ever sense, but we re- we read it from Scripture. We realize it through Revelation that the world is at some form of war. That even deep within ourselves, in our relationships, in our communities, in our states, in our country, and in our world, there is a warfare going on which finds its root in this fact that I think C.S. Lewis lays out. And because that's the world we live in, we also know that our faith is going to exist in that A world that sometimes is uncertain. A world that sometimes goes one direction, goes another. Because there's a war happening. Because there is a world created by God, claimed by God, counterclaimed by Satan. And we live in that world. We live and we exist in that world. Not a utopia that we can create by political means, whether you would be left or right or center. No politics is ever going to eliminate this truth. No amount of money is ever going to eliminate this truth. It's the world we live in. It's a world of unanswered questions It's a world wonderfully, wonderfully created, amazingly bountiful and productive. So many blessings, but so much that we don't understand. And our faith is a faith that must must be able to exist in both. For it to be a real faith, a faith for all seasons. Number two... So number one, it must be rooted in the reality of our world. Number two, it must be rooted in the truth about ourselves. A faith for all seasons makes room for us as imperfect people. People who can shine, but also can be disastrously dark. People who can love, but also can hate. 
The truth about ourselves is that just as the world is at war, that we are compromised in and of ourselves. That we are broken in and of ourselves. And that the thing that gives us hope, the thing that gives us light, is nothing short of the salvation that we receive through Jesus. That is what enables us in this particular battle that we live in with ourselves. The battle of sin. The battle of being who we are. To nonetheless hold our bearings. To nonetheless be transformed. To nonetheless be changed. Paul himself in Romans 5. Paul, the Apostle Paul, figured this out. He knew this. He knew that there is a war within himself. He says, I know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. Just like we confess. We confess every Sunday morning, we are in bondage to sin. That comes straight from Scripture, straight, straight from Paul's life. For we know that the law is spiritual, sold into the bondage of sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing everything I hate. Raise your hand if you do things you don't want to do. Pretty much all the time. There's a few honest people here. Just kidding. You're all honest, right? Just kidding. No, it's true. I mean, like, I there's a lot of things on a given day, and you can break it down to the smallest things. That, I want to do this. I, I want to eat better. I want to spend more time doing the things that I know are important. I don't want to worry as much. I don't, but then you do all that stuff anyway, and you're just fighting yourself. This is Paul doing the same thing. If I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So no longer, uh, I, for I know that nothing good dwells in me in and of itself. That is in my flesh. For the willing of part of me is present, but the doing is, is not. I mean, think about everybody who's ever decided to do a New Year's resolution. I mean, but just exercise, for example. The willing is there, the doing is not. I mean, pretty much, pretty much lays it out just perfectly. For the good that I want to do, I don't do, but I practice the very evil things I don't want to do. If I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me. The one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law at members itself waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Just take all those words in. Can't you relate? Don't you feel that way sometimes? What's the answer? What is the answer? Paul tells us, he says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free? Because that's bondage. That's, that's, that's a war we don't want to be in. That's slavery we don't want to be in. Who will set me free, he asks, from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Thanks be to God. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free? The answer. Thanks be to God, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're going to have a faith for all seasons, a faith that's honest to truth, honest to reality, honest to the world that we live in, it must be based in the reality of the world, it must be rooted in the truth about ourselves, but most importantly, no, I'll say finally but not least, Last but not least, it must be rooted in the promise of God. It must be rooted in the promise of God. I actually think it's easier to have a strong faith on the ends of the spectrum. Things are amazing. When you have a mansion and you drive a Lamborghini, man, that's good, right? I really thank God for everything He's done. A jet, a private jet. There's preachers 
that will there is a, pre, a story of a preacher who, who who has a private jet and it was like a three million dollar jet and he was asking his church and and you know I don't need this big of a plane but I, I'd like some kind of plane. no but he was asking his congregation for a six million dollar jet because he needed to be able to fly nonstop around the world to be able to spread the gospel faster. And you get key amens, amens, and this is how the world should be, and this is how great, and it's easy to be faithful, if that's the case, right? Everything's great. It's also probably a little bit easier to fall on God when things are really bad, when you have nothing else. Sometimes that's a gift, because that's the only thing that will lead us into a life. Those things that happen aren't a gift. Don't get me wrong. They're terrible. Things can be terrible. But the fact that it would lead you into a deeper faith is a gift. Right? I think it's I think it's easier to be on the spectrum. I think what's harder. What's harder is to have a faith for all seasons. To be equally committed to God. To be equally faithful. To be equally experiencing who God is in all seasons of life. And isn't that what we want? Wouldn't we rather feel close to God all the time? Rather than just when things are really bad or when they're really good? Wouldn't we rather feel close to God all the time? I think the answer is yes. And that's where we come to this final promise of God. The one promise I think that really carries uh, carries the, the, the story here with regard to a faith for all seasons is the promise that God makes throughout Scripture and Jesus Himself makes in the New Testament is the promise that He will be with you. That no matter what, God will be with you. That is to say that in the moments of good, in the times of good, yes, faith should be strong, gratitude should be abundant. When things are difficult and nothing's going quite right, yes, faith should be strong. Because in both cases, God is with us. And most of our lives is lived in between. And so I hate to leave God out. Of most of our lives, right? Most of our lives is the mundane, the in between stuff. But even there, God will be with you. Joshua 1 9, it says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Deuteronomy 31 6, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. Of course, Matthew 28, 20, one of the most familiar, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded. Now this is Jesus at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. The very end, the last thing that he says, the word he wants to leave them with. He says, Behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And then Paul, finally, in Romans 8, assures us of this promise in uh, a wonderful text. Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The promise of God's presence. If we're to have a faith for all seasons, it must be a faith rooted in the reality of our warfare world, grounded in the truth about ourselves, and rooted yet more so in the promise of God. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for 
we, th- we thank you for Revelation. We thank you for the stories of those who've gone before. Those who, though having the same faith, being uh, warranting being even mentioned in Scripture, but yet experiencing different circumstances in their life, Lord God, it reminds us and it shows us that we are to be a people of faith for all seasons. But even more so, we thank you that you are a God for all seasons. We thank you that you are present with us no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here's the moment of truth. Who's got a song? Oh, Kathy, hand up right away. Six ninety nine is a great hymn for holy. Okay, six ninety nine. Thank you.
the breath in our lungs, the thoughts in our minds. We thank you today. We thank you and we praise you. And we pray, Father, that as we go about our days, knowing that we all experience a variety of different experiences in life, that circumstances are different for all of us, but that despite that, your promises are true. And despite that, our faith is not based in our circumstances, but rather our faith is based in your promises. It's based in, Lord God, what you have done through us, for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that this truth would stand at the center of each of our lives of faith. For us here and for your whole church. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the nations today, Lord God. We thank you for, for the blessings you've provided in our own nation that we live. But Lord, as our nation is in a time of somewhat disunity, and struggle, we pray, Father, for peace. We pray for unity. We pray for a common vision. We pray for a common will. Guide our country, each citizen, and our leaders. Lord, we pray for those nations, Lord God, where your word is not heard. We pray for those nations in distress of some form or another. Lord, we pray that your blessings of peace and provision would be true not only for us here, but for all the nations of this world. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in need today. We pray for Victor Weigel as he continues to battle health concerns following up his transplants. We ask, Father, that you would comfort him, strengthen him, that you would bring healing to his body, give wisdom to the doctors as they determine what's going on in his heart, Give strength, of course, to his wife, Bev, as she continues to be with him, support him, and strengthen him. Lord, we pray for, we pray for healing for, for Raymond Ellingson after his surgery, and for continued presence, love, and care for Dottie. We pray for Helen Seafelt, Donnie Carlson, for Jerry Lugadensky and his continued um, battle against cancer. We thank you for the good news that he has received through time. We pray also for Marvin Callahan, Mike's father. We pray that you would, or Tim's father, we pray that you would give him strength in recovering from the treatment from cancer. We pray that you would strengthen him, Lord, by your hand. And for all the needs that are represented here by each and every person, for every worry and concern that is represented here, Lord, we hand those to you now. Lord, in your mercy. For this church, Lord God, we thank you for everything that you do here. The work you are doing here, we thank you for the blessings of, of company and of fellowship and of friendship. Lord, take us each, guide us each and every day this week as we go out, that we would reflect who you are, your love, your generosity to the world around us. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you always. Please share this peace with one another.
bottom of page 67. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs>